We bless you, Lord, with all our hearts today. We desire to honor you. We join with the psalmist to declare that you are worthy to be praised because you have heard the voice and the pleas for mercy from the hearts of your people. We declare you, O Lord, are our strength and our shields. And in you our heart trusts and rests because in you we are helped in our times of trouble. Therefore our hearts will exalt you and with songs we will give thanks to you. The Lord is the strength of his people. So come and strengthen your children here today. You are the saving refuge of those who trust in you. So save your people. Bless your heritage. Be our shepherd and carry us in your arms forever. Father, we thank you for the grace that surrounds us, that sustains us. And Father, we also want to thank you that you are here even now through the presence of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you, we honor you, we bless you, and we invite you to come and lead us into truth. We invite you, Spirit, to convict hearts, open eyes, open ears, so that our spiritual and physical senses would be fully attuned to your voice and your message for us today. And Father, I ask that you would fill me with your Spirit now, strengthen me, anoint me, empower me, and Holy Spirit, I invite you to preach through me today so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be pleasing and honorable in your sights. O Lord, our rock, our redeemer, and it is in your precious name we pray. Amen. You know, taking my uh, son Enoch to the doctor's office has really changed my perspective on pain. I hate seeing Enoch in pain, and I know, obviously, he hates being in pain. Uh, But I also know that sometimes the pain he experiences through a shots or the discomfort of going through an x-ray is necessary for his health. Now, there is no way that he can understand the significance or the benefit of the discomfort that he goes through right now, but there is a purpose behind his pain that he cannot fully understand yet. And, you know, uh, in the earlier part of his life, he also hated taking medicine. But by God's grace, for some reason, he loves taking medicine now. And so we have no problem. He just says, give it to me, and I'll just, you know, chug it down right away. So we're thankful for that. Um, but actually, um, I still remember the times when we first had to try to feed him medicine, and he hated it. Uh, we would, you know, say, hey, you know, time for medicine. He'd be like, no. And then he just goes on playing. So, no, we really have to take this medicine. He'd say, no. And then, uh, and eventually we have to, I have to hold him down. I'm not going to hold him, and I never realize how strong, like, a two-year-old can be. You know, but he's like, scream, <laughs> right? So, finally, we, like, force it in, and we don't really know if it went in because everything's, like, you know, smearing everywhere and falling out of his mouth, but we're just hoping something got in there, you know? And what also surprised me is as he's like fighting, he's like screaming, no, I hate this, stop it, I hate you, stop it, stop it. And then right when he's done, he could, he'd be fine. He goes back to playing right away, you know. And I was always mesmerized at how quickly uh, he can get over what appears to be such a traumatic experience. You know, he could move on very quickly. So I'm thankful for that. Uh, But even though it was so difficult, for me to see him going through that kind of pain, I knew he needed to go through that in order to uh, heal and benefit his body. And that whole process has helped me see even my pain uh, through a different lens, through the lens of my Father in heaven. You see, our perspective in times of pain is crucial as we navigate life uh, through faith. And so what we want to explore today, so how should we view our days of pain as a people of faith? How should the factor of pain influence our perspectives on life? And that's what we want to look at today. So turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. 
and we'll look at the proper perspective we need to have in our lives, especially during times of pain. And you can follow along with me in your outlines as well. And first and foremost, it is in our days of pain that gives us the opportunity to love Christ more than comfort. So I repeat, love Christ more than comfort. Right, so one of the biggest challenges in our times of pain is our desperate desire to pursue comfort more than pursuing Christ. Because that is our default tendency by nature, right? As fallen, selfish, comfort-seeking humans, uh, when we're going through a difficult time, when we're in a crisis, when we're going through pain, we immediately want to have our pain relieved as soon as possible. Right? That's our default nature. Uh, but Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, let's look at verse 1, he says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So once again, Christ is our example in our days of suffering. Verse 1 says, since Christ suffered in the flesh, meaning while he was physically here on this planet, since he suffered during this time here, it says, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Or another way we could put it is, arm yourselves with the same attitude, with the same approach. Meaning, just as Jesus walked the road of Calvary to suffer for doing good, have that same attitude in you. So be ready to suffer for doing good. Because suffering will come when you carry the cross. It comes with carrying the cross as we follow Jesus. Suffering will be a part of following our Savior. And so we must understand this. Then he says, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, it does not mean that if you suffer, you're finished with sin. What he's saying is, when you choose in your suffering, when you choose Christ over comfort, meaning you choose to desire to please God more than just pleasing my flesh, in the midst of the pain, when that is your desire, you have overcome a major source of temptation that people fall into. A major victory of faith is to say, life is hard, but I trust Jesus. To say, I want to be free from pain, but I want Jesus more. Therefore, don't let suffering allow you to compromise into sin. Instead, in your suffering, stay close to the Savior. Because that is one of the most fundamental purposes of pain, and that is to draw you closer to the suffering servants of Jesus Christ. Amen? Because the true comfort that your soul needs is only found in Christ. If we seek comfort from our pain apart from Christ, that comfort cannot bring the peace and strength for our soul that our souls are really longing for. You see, again, it is the default nature of us that when we're in pain, we want comforts. But for far too many of us, we look for comfort in the wrong places. Because true comfort that will strengthen and bring peace is found in Christ. Ice cream cannot do that. Shopping cannot do that. It is when we pursue Christ more than comfort that we receive true peace and strength for our souls. You know, the horror of Bako Haram has been in the news a lot this past year. His kidnapping and selling of hundreds of girls earlier this year made headlines around the world. And his gang of terror has also completely destroyed villages and cities throughout Nigeria that had heavy Christian presence or influence. In June of this year, 
just a few months ago, over 100 of Boko Haram's men dressed in military attire attacked a Christian village on a Sunday while church services were happening. Uh, and this city in Nigeria went into chaos as these men started literally killing and slashing people uh, in the Sunday morning worship services. Many people were slaughtered that day, including many young children. John uh, Yakabuku was there, arriving early to attend uh, his Sunday service, and he was going to attend the second service of that day. And while he was approaching the church building, he could hear the cries of many people. And so he rushed inside and he saw people being slaughtered and killed at such alarming rates. And in front of him was a six-year-old boy who had just been severely severed by a machete. And so he picked him up and he ran out to take him to a nearby hospital. But men stopped him, stabbed the boy and cut off the boy's head. And then they began stabbing John instead. And so as he was bleeding profusely, lying on the ground, they left him for dead, thinking he was a goner, and yet he survived. When he awoke, he and his family uh, escaped to a local refugee camp, but as weeks passed by, their food supply depleted. And so John decided to go back to their village and to their house, hoping to find some of their farm animals still alive so that he can take it and feed his family. And so even though it was going to be dangerous, they were in desperate times. And so he went back to his village and he found his home and it was still intact. He gathered some of the farm animals and right before he left, he decided to stop inside of his house one last time to gather a few precious items like the family Bible. But as he left his house, some men saw him and stopped him, and they tied him up. They, say, they said to him, we know you are a Christian, and they began cutting off both of his hands. They said to him, you must convert to Islam, or you will die a painful death. He said, you can kill my body, but you cannot kill my soul. Using machete, as well as another knife, they continued to dig and slice into his feet and also his back. They continued to demand that he renounce, renounce Christ and follow Islam, but he continued to refuse. So they took out an axe and began digging into his knees. He fainted from all the blood loss that his body had, and they left him for dead, again thinking that he was gone. But he woke up in a hospital. There was a missionary from Voice of Martyrs who had found him, and they took him to get help. And when they asked him what happened, he told his story of the slaughter that his church, his family, and now he also had endured. But then he said this, but I forgive these Islamic militants because they do not know what they are doing. I am still here today by the grace of God. And because of Christ, my Savior, I have the strength to still speak and testify that he is Lord. Jesus is my strength. He is my protector. And he is my comforter. And as long as he gives me breath, I will never stop proclaiming his name. Fascinating testimony. That kind of response can only come from someone whose love and pursuit in life is Christ more than anything else. How is this possible? As verse 2 also says in 1 Peter 4, So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Because our aim in this life is to please God. And we do life in order to do His will, not our own. We are here not to do whatever we want, we are here to do the will of the Father in heaven. To say, whatever you want, Jesus, we will do. Because you are our Lord. You are our Master. And we are here to serve you. Why? Because, Jesus, we love you. And we trust you. So in order to navigate through our days of difficulty, we must pursue and love Christ more than comfort. And the reason why I think it is so important in this hour... 
to hear the testimonies of our brothers and sisters around the world who have chosen to love Christ more than comfort is because our comfortable Christianity gives us a lukewarm understanding of what true discipleship is to look like. And we need that splash of cold water reality in our face every once in a while so that we remember and we can see through these people's lives what Christ following discipleship is supposed to look like. And it is when Christ is our everything. That our pursuit, our desire, and our love is for Christ more than our own comforts. And we need these testimonies to speak into our hearts, to challenge our faith, and to refine our character. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And so we need to be sharpened by the saints who are suffering for the name of Christ. Amen? So it's an important place that we need to begin. That one of the purposes of suffering and pain is for us to have the opportunity to pursue, to choose to love Christ more than comfort. But there's another thing that we must be willing to do and that is to leave the world behind. So everyone repeat, leave the world behind. Because the declaration of true discipleship is you can take the world, but give me Jesus. You could have all the toys of this world. You get all the trinkets that this world is chasing after. You can have it, but as for me, I want Christ. You could have the worlds, but give me Jesus. That is the declaration of true discipleship. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Meaning, your time when you used to live just to satisfy your fleshly desires, that time of your life is gone. Or at least it should be, if you're in Christ. You used to make decisions based on, hey, if it feels good, do it. Everybody else is doing it, why can't I? You used to make decisions based on you and what you want. But now in Christ, we make our decisions based on Christ. Verse 4, with respect to this, they're surprised. And when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. And this is the testimony that I've heard from some of you, even. That after coming to faith in Christ, your friends now wonder why you don't go out with them anymore. To the same places to get drunk, or to look for guys, or to look for girls. Why are you so different now? And it is because you love Jesus. And when you love Jesus, your whole world changes. Your whole value system changes. So that instead of pursuing the same things that the world does, you pursue greater treasure because now you're a part of a greater kingdom. The, you see, this is why the prosperity gospel does not make sense for lovers of Jesus. The prosperity gospel is in essence chasing after the same broken toys that the world chases after. But we need to remember that our life on this planet is not about getting nicer cars, bigger homes, and a bigger bank accounts. It's about using all that we have been blessed with from God, who is the giver and owner of it all. All that we have from God, we use those things to make deposits into God's bank account so that the gospel can spread, so that the poor can be fed, so that justice can reign into the villages and vulnerable places on this planet. Amen? You know, I love meeting Christian business people who know why God has blessed them with money. I met the producer of the movie Trade of Innocence, and he said the reason why he made that movie and provided millions of dollars from his own pocket to create that movie was because of a visit he made to Cambodia with his family many years ago. And as he was there, even though he was with his wife and three little daughters, 
uh, men would still approach him asking if he wanted to buy children for sex. And he was horrified that this was happening. And uh, seeing the hundreds of children who were for sale throughout that country, um, and also seeing that they were the same age as his daughters, he wanted to do something to change this. And so several years ago, when the, this issue was not in the public radar as it is today, he decided to raise awareness by creating a film. And so uh, he, he's never made a film before, but he invested his own money to find producers and filmmakers and actors and all this stuff like that uh, to help make it. So it was based on cases that IJM worked on in Cambodia that the movie Trade of Innocence was born. And the reason why I was so blessed by his testimony is that uh, is because, he, again, he's not a filmmaker, but he had the resources to make it happen. And he used it not for himself, but in order to try to save the lives of many in that nation. And I'm so blessed when I talk to some of our OEMers as well, who own their own businesses, who own their own restaurants, and I've challenged you throughout the years here in our pursuit of justice, that if you own your own companies and if you own your own businesses, then I want to challenge you to save some entry-level positions, uh, these jobs for these women who have come out of sex, sexual slavery in this country. Provide jobs for these single moms who don't have a, even a high school education so that they can have a possible new future in the realm of financial security. Uh, provide jobs for orphans who have gone through the system and the institution so that they too can get a break and possible new futures for them as well. And I love how some of the people in OEM have responded that they have saved these jobs and some of these women and some of these single moms are now employed at these businesses because of that and I'm so proud of them. And also I'm so excited because one guy said, you know what, my first business went so well, I want to start another business and all the profits that come from that one, I want to uh, put those profits back into the most vulnerable people in our community. And when I hear testimonies like that, I get so excited because I'm like, they finally get it. There are people who get it as to why God blessed them with money, why God blessed them with jobs, why God blessed them with their own companies, why God blessed them with an entrepreneurial spirit, and that is so that they can be a blessing with what God has given to them. That is how Christian business people are to operate, not like the ways of this world. Another person I want to tell you about is a person that I met uh, several years ago in Thailand. And what he does is he created uh, clean water filters and tanks uh, to be uh, used throughout northern Thailand. He was doing um, some work for a previous job that he once did of, uh, you know, these different, visiting these different tribal areas in northern Thailand. And he found that so many places did not have clean water. So... He invested millions of his own money to research and create water technology and he built this own uh, water plant in Thailand. And what that did is it provided jobs for the community but also it provided clean water for thousands of people in rural Thailand. And when people would ask him why he did this, he would always point them back to Jesus and says, it is because Jesus loves me and Jesus loves you. It is because he has blessed me so that I can bless you. We are blessed to be a blessing. We are blessed with the gospel to share the gospel. We are blessed with an abundance of finances to use that blessing to be a blessing. If you're financially well off, and all of us are compared to the 80% of this world that are not as financially blessed as we are. But if you're financially well off, pray that God would give you a vision and dreams, great dreams, kingdom dreams of how you can be used with the resources that God has given you to build his kingdom for the glory of God. And I stress this often, this principle that must be ingrained in our hearts whenever I speak about finances and giving, is that the reason why God has blessed you with more than you need 
is so that you can meet the needs of others. That is why you have more than you need. And that is why there is an imbalance in this world where there are some who have abundance and some who are needy so that those who are in abundance can be the conduits and regents of grace to be able to be agents of his generous heart to those who are in need. Because God is the owner of it all. God is the giver of it all. And our God is a generous God. So when you become generous in your heart in giving, you are becoming godly. Because that is what our God is like. Amen? Never forget that, people. As God continues to bless your life, materially, financially, there is a reason why God will bless you with more, and that is so that you can be a channel of His blessings into this world. You see, you live differently now because your perspective is seeing things through the lens of faith in Christ. You don't just see things differently, you see things properly. Because now, through faith, you are able to see true reality. Faith allows you to see true reality. You can now see what is real treasure and what is temporary trash. And that is when you can leave this world behind and say, you can have the world, but give me Jesus. Because you have the eyes of faith to see and that is divine wisdom from above. And then you can also see that all of life is a trust given to us and we will be called into account one day. As it says in verse 5, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So we will all give an account to God one day. And this is the wisdom that comes through faith in Christ. Why don't you go to the same parties you once did? Why don't you live as selfishly as you once did? Because now you're able to see reality that all that we do will be held unto account before a holy God one day. How we give will be recorded and, and rewarded for those who give in faith. So everything changes. Your choices are different. Your choices are no longer based on, does it feel good? Do I want to do it now? Your choices are now based on, there is a God in heaven who is sovereign over all things, who sees all things, and who has desired a calling in my life to be used for His glory to expand His kingdom. These are the filters through which we make our choices now. Amen? Verse 6, For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Now, the dead in verse 6 is in reference to Christians who have died. All right, this verse can, uh, for some people, they think, oh, do we preach the gospel to dead people? Right? Is there a second chance? No, he's not talking about that. If you understand the context of how this is used, he is referencing Christians who died. Before they died, they too heard the gospel, meaning they too needed to hear the gospel. Meaning, even Christians need to hear the gospel. That we never outgrow the gospel. We must grow deeper into the gospel. The gospel is not just for non-believers or young believers. The gospel is for all believers, all ages, for all of time. We need the gospel every day. We need to be reminded of the gospel daily to strengthen our faith to know that the promises of Christ are greater than the promises of this world. That will give us proper perspective in our times of pain. You see, especially when we are suffering and then we get into self-centered mode, we need to hear the gospel again. So that we do not focus on this momentary, temporary, present time period. 
but we are able to see all things through the lens of faith. So we need the gospel to remind us again why we are here. So we are to love Christ more than comfort. We are to leave the world behind. And there's a third thing uh, through which we are to understand our lives when we encounter pain. And that is to live with the end in mind. So everyone repeat, live with the end in mind. So, the proper perspective to have in our days of pain is to always keep one eye on eternity. Leadership wisdom teaches us that you need to begin with the end in mind. But spiritual wisdom teaches us that we need to always live with the end in mind. And that is what Peter is teaching us as well. 1 Peter 4, 7, it says, The end of all things is at hand. The end is near. Right? The last days are here. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. So what does it look like to live with the end in mind? It means we pray. Prayer is an investment and partnership into God's kingdom that allows us to be a part of His kingdom work being built all around the world. And only those with faith can persevere in prayer, especially in times of pain. You see, only when we live with the end in mind can we see that prayer is never a waste. God moves through the prayers of His people. God responds to the prayers of His people. God is glorified through the prayers of His people. And God will reward the prayers of His people. Billy Graham was once asked, if you could do your life all over again, is there anything that you would change? Now, Billy Graham, arguably the most famous evangelist in history, reaching more people with the gospel than any other one person in the history of humankind? Um, is there anything that you would do over again? Is there anything you regret? He said, yes. If I could live my life over again, he said, I would study the Bible more and I would pray more. People who live with the end in mind know the power and the internal investment that prayer brings. So the spiritually wise will pray. It also means those who are eternally wise in our perspective on life will be people who love. Verse 8 and 9. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Love is what we were created for, to love God and to love others. Everything else in your whole life means nothing if we do not love God and love others. Those are the two primary things that we were created for. Everything in our life is meant to be done out of an overflow of our love for God and our love for others. This verse also teaches us that it was the love of Christ that covered over our sins. It is love that shows us we are His. And it is love that is the result of the Holy Spirit's role in our lives because the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of a life that is connected to the vine of Christ, that fruit is love. The greatest of all of these is love. But living with the end in mind will also mean that you will serve his church. Look at verse 10 and 11. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So those with an eternal perspective know that God gifted us with abilities 
for a reason that God has placed you in this period of human history, in this nation, in this city, and in this church for a specific reason. And he's given you the experiences, abilities, spiritual gifts, passions. God has shaped you just the way you are for a reason. And one of those reasons why you are here in this city, in this church, is so that you might be a blessing to this church as you serve this church. That's very interesting that he includes this as spiritual wisdom of those who live with the end in mind. That there is an eternal ramification that is impacted by our serving Christ as we serve his body, the church, today. Those with speaking gifts to speak, teach, and encourage. Those with serving gifts to be the hands and feet of Christ. And we do it all with the strength that God provides. Why? So that in all things, God receives the glory through your life. All of life's purposes and aim is to bring glory and honor to Jesus. But the road that we will walk on will be painful on this earth. Why? Because Jesus calls us to take up your cross and follow me. And the road that Jesus walked, that we follow him on, is the road of Calvary. The road of the cross. And the road of Calvary comes with sadness. The road of Calvary comes with pain, with loss. And it even comes with crucifixion. But that is not the end. So we don't focus on the temporary pain. We don't focus on the loss. We don't focus on the crucifixion. Walking the road of Calvary with Jesus will have crucifixion, but that is not the end of our journey. Following Jesus ends with resurrection and glory. Amen? You know, the death of Brittany Maynard made major headlines the past few weeks when she decided to choose the day of her death after discovering she had a brain tumor. She made a bucket list of what she wanted to do before she died, and she finished that, week, that list over the following weeks. Now, while assisted suicide is illegal in most states in the U.S., uh, Oregon uh, is legal, and that's where she decided to move for the final days of her life. And it was a heartbreaking journey to follow her story. Knowing that she did, she did not know Christ um, or know that there's more to this life than just the time on this planet. Now, we, of course, do not know her pain. We don't know her struggles. We don't know her fears. But we do know that there was an important element missing in her life, and that was the hope found in Christ. After she died, uh, there were other testimonies that started popping up of people who also had brain tumors that died a very similar death in terms of why they died, but they chose a different path to their final days. One story that popped up during uh, the days following her death was about a guy named Clayton McDonald, uh, who was a teenager who also died from the same brain tumor. But he knew Christ. And that changed how he decided to live his final days. He saw his cancer as a gift, he says, because of what it allowed him to do. It opened up whole new opportunities to share the gospel with people that he would have never had if not for his sickness. He said to his dad one day, Dad, I'm not going to fight this anymore, meaning his sickness. I think this is what God wants me to go through. And so he started speaking and sharing his testimony and sharing the gospel. And it was during this time period that he was suddenly given new avenues to share Christ. He said, I want to use this for God's glory. I want my life to count, no matter how long or how short my life may be. 
Again, he was a teenager, just 18 years old at the time, and then he began to reach out to other high schools and junior highs and teenagers and other people and anyone who would listen to him. And he told people, yes, I'm dying, but here's the kicker. So are you guys. We all have a clock, a timeline of when we're going to kick the bucket. But for me, I have the luxury of knowing when I'm going to die. So he committed the rest of his life to telling as many people as he could of the life-saving message of Jesus Christ. That there is a God in heaven who knows all of our pain, our regret, our sins, our failures, and our mistakes. But he loves us still. And so he sent his son Jesus to die for our sins. Why? So that we can now be forgiven and we can now have what is life as it was meant to be. Real life, the fullness of life with God. For all of eternity. He was able to finish the rest of his days much differently from Brittany because he was able to see his pain through the lens of faith. You see, how we see Christ will determine how we see our pain. How we see Christ will change everything. So it's crucial that we look to Jesus. That we look to Jesus in our pain. To look to Jesus today in your pain. And know that you are not alone. You do not suffer alone. You do not suffer without a greater purpose. Because in the wisdom and sovereignty of God, there is a purpose behind every pain. There is a purpose. There is a healer. There is a redeemer. There is a savior. And his name is Jesus. There is a purpose behind every pain. So look to Jesus. Take his hand and he will walk you through the dark days. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the glorious reminder that this world is not our home in its current form, that all our pain is not the final chapter, but God, that you are writing a glorious story, your story of how in your majesty, in your mystery, and in your sovereignty, how a people so unfaithful like us can be used by you to bring glory to your name in the end. So, Father, strengthen the faith of all the hearts in this room now who are walking the road of Calvary. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep our hands holding tight to your hands. Though we cannot see the future, we know who holds the future in his hands. And that is enough. You are enough. So, Father, strengthen our faith to hold on to you, to hope in you. No matter how dark, the light of the world will shine in the end. So we thank you that you are mighty. We praise you because there is no one greater than you. There is no circumstance greater than you. You are greater. You are the greatest, Jesus. And so we bank on you. You're strong. You're sovereign. You're in control. And we're so glad we are yours. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory without faults because of the saving, forgiving blood of Jesus, 
but with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, praise, worship, power, and authority before all time. Be exalted in our hearts. Be treasured now and be exalted forevermore. Amen.